I'm Cheryl Belson and I'm with the American Sewing Guild and I am very excited today to have with me Heather Lou from Closet Case Patterns. Um, she's my own personal sewing crush and uh, she is the founder and director of Closet Case Patterns. Um, Heather started her business back in I believe 2013 with a bombshell swimsuit pattern and since then the pattern line and her company has just grown like crazy to 25 patterns I believe and uh, we're working on our 23rd now. 23rd okay so 23 patterns and seven supply kits I think I counted out on your website. Sounds about right. And four online classes. Yeah, so I can't wait to learn more about your uh, your journey and uh, your line. And so Heather, welcome. I am really appreciative for you to agree to do this with us. Oh, it's my pleasure. Love a good sewing guild. <laughs> I feel like I've been a closet case junkie forever and I was actually surprised that your company is really relatively young still. You've been on quite a, a trajectory and I read that you went from interior design to what you are today. Can you tell us a little bit about that uh, big step? Yeah, sure. So I graduated from university and kind of was a little aimless for a few years and then went back to school for interior design because I love design. And at the time I was kind of torn between doing fashion design or interior design. And I knew the fashion industry was a little bit toxic and I thought, you know what, let's try out this interior design, see if I like it. And I did, I ended up loving it. So I did a three year degree and then I went and worked for a firm, the same firm for five years. And we did mostly commercial work. Um, and if I was lucky, I would get to do a restaurant or a store, but most of the time we were designing shopping centers. So this went on for five years. I was very happy at my job. And then a couple years in, I had gotten into a bunch of debt because I was addicted to shopping. And I had a bunch of credit card debt and I said, okay, I've always wanted to learn how to sew. I need a new hobby. I'm going to spend a year. I'm going to try not to buy anything new. And anything I knew that I bring in is either going to be thrifted or I'm going to learn how to sew. And so I went to my girlfriend's house. She used to be, she was a costume designer and I had this vintage pattern and she helped me ex understand the sewing pattern. And I cut the whole thing out on her floor and I used a serger. The first time I ever sewed a pattern, I used a serger. Um, and it just kind of started this love affair for sewing for me. And when I would get home from work every night, I used to be, well, I'm still a, I love to cook, but that used to be my hobby. But then I got home and I would sew for five or six hours, eat like ramen for dinner and go to bed and then started wearing all these clothes into work and got really just addicted. You know, everybody who sews knows that feeling when you start making clothes and you have ideas that you want particular me at the time I loved vintage and I could never find vintage that fit and all of a sudden I could use vintage patterns oh, yeah. so it really took over for a few years and then I ended up because I have all this technical skill you know I would be making 20 30 page technical documents to give to a contractor to go build a shopping center um, when I started learning a little bit more about pattern drafting it it wasn't as far away as you think, you know, like the, all of the skills I'd learned in design school, the technical skills I had were really transferable. Mm -hmm. And so I ended up working on that bombshell swimsuit. And initially I thought, oh, I'll just release this as a free pattern. I'm not, you know, this is a thing I'm working on. I don't think anybody's going to want it. And then I started working on it using at work in the office, using the Ill Adobe Illustrator to format everything, writing the instructions. I thought, okay, this is a lot of work. Maybe I'll, I'll charge $10 for it. And if 15 people buy it, it'll be great. Um, but it ended up kind of going viral, you know, in 2013, a ton of people were making it and it, it, that pattern ended up kind of getting me out of debt. And then I was at my job and I was just getting a little dissatisfied, um, getting a little bit of itchy feet. And I thought, well, maybe there's like a business here. I'll release another pattern and I'll see how that goes. And I did the Netty dress and bodysuit, which was kind of like a body con dress and bodysuit. And that one did really well. And so I realized, okay, there's some legs here. So I ended up quitting my job in 2014. And it's been, I've been doing it full time since then. And now, as you said, like the company's grown a lot. And so I now have four full time uh, staff. And I'm not working in my, well, I'm working in my apartment right now because uh, Montreal's sheltering in place. Uh, but we have a beautiful studio and yeah, it's been great. I feel very, very, very lucky that I've managed to build a business from what was essentially just a hobby a few years ago. Wow, that's a fantastic trajectory. It really is. Well, as I was reading a little bit about um, that switch that you made, you mentioned, and I think it was a blog that you wrote, um, 
back when you were first making the transition that the idea of consumerism and the plight of the worker in the fashion industry really kind of grabbed at you at a heart level. And so can you tell us a little bit about what that, what those uh, ethics, how they play in your business today? Certainly. I mean, I think I have an uncommon job history in general, but one of the things I actually did, one of the jobs I worked at, so I actually worked uh, on the line for Daimler Chrysler for three years, building Dodge Caravans when I was in university. Really? And so I have, a, and I come from a blue collar working class town, so I have a very strong uh, relationship to kind of working class, uh, working class issues. And the more that I started reading about how the fast fashion, how toxic the fast fashion industry is, and how um, naturally exploitative, exploitative it is, especially now that we've moved all of this uh, work overseas, where there's no, you know, we're in countries that are so desperate for an economy that they do not have things like labor laws. Um, and not only are we losing all of these jobs from North America, but we're, we're bringing them into countries where the workers aren't protected, they're not treated well. Obviously, we know what kind of disasters happen when we have unethical people who are running these companies, like that horrible factory uh, destruction in Bangladesh. So as somebody who loved clothes and was addicted to shopping and addicted to fast fashion, I was, as particularly as I was designing shopping malls, we were designing a mall in Doha, Qatar, that the, it was, there was no budget. When I started working on the project, uh, the Shah of Qatar was the one who funded it. And my boss said, yeah, you would do whatever you want, marble, there's no budget, however much it costs, it costs. Wow. And then we're building this project and then my boss is going to do site visits and they're doing construction and nobody is wearing hard hats. There is no protection whatsoever. People were like dying on the site because the work conditions were so unsafe. And so I was already wrestling with my own consumerism and then to kind of have this physical, I'm actually involved in this project where people are getting hurt to support this kind of shopping economy where other people are getting hurt. It really started to feel incongruous with my own kind of beliefs and I, I will say that kind of existentially I got a little um, I was really struggling to continue to do my job so once I discovered sewing and this community and realized that there was a way to run an ethical business there was a way to participate in this economy where I wasn't exploiting anybody um, it felt really good um, and even now I'll still you know I'll buy clothes from time to time I'm, I'm much more selective about where I buy I try to support um, independent designers who are having things made uh, either locally or ethically overseas. Um, and my consumption just in general has gone down a lot because I just don't feel like I need things as much. I've had a bit of a brain shift about that. Mm -hmm. So it definitely guides how we run the business because I'm not at this point, I mean, who's, who's to say in the future, but at this point I'm comfortable doing four to six patterns a year. We don't need to do five patterns a month. We, the quality is really important to us. So I would rather take our time, develop a really great product that people are going to be happy with and do less of that than more of something that I don't have as much control over the quality. Yeah. You seemed from what I can tell to be um, that those, those foundational beliefs and ethics and feelings about people um, are, are deeply held for you. And I felt like I saw that, I guess that about a year ago when there was a, a a lot of talk began to emerge about size inclu inclusivity. And um, as a matter of fact, I watched, um, you kind of had a really emotional and heartfelt uh, message that you shared on Instagram that was sort of like the launching pad for you moving into expanding your size ranges. So can you tell us a little bit about how that impacted you personally and about the journey of, of broadening your size line? Yeah, certainly. I mean, part of the reason that I'm actually res partly responsible for that conversation starting, which at, in the moment when it happened felt awful, <laughs> really stressful, because there was a lot of people mad at me. But in the end, I'm actually really glad the conversation happened, because I think it emboldened the plus size sewing community to really communicate how excluded they felt from the sewing industry. You know, a lot of people start sewing because they're going into stores and they can't find clothes that fit. And they think, okay, I'm going to start sewing. And then they start sewing. And then they find patterns that don't fit them. And there are a lot of structural reasons why brands, either a sewing brand or a fashion brand, don't 
have plus size lines and I commented on a friend's post who is works in the fashion industry and actually has a plus size pattern line about why people don't do this. And I basically just said, yeah, absolutely. These are the reasons we're not doing it right now. I'd love to one day, but I don't know how we can. And it's not about excluding people. It's just about resources and we just don't have the resources right now. And it really, that comment made people a lot really angry because whether or not it's my intention to exclude people, the fact that our sizes only go at the time, only went from zero to 20, we were excluding people. So my intention was kind of irrelevant. And it ended up starting, and actually it was a conversation I had today with Jillian on our Instagram Live about the um, measurement, sharing, I can't remember what the hashtag is now, but people started sharing their measurements, taking, you know, they're sharing photo of their body and their measurements and with a hashtag. And after this uh, kind of controversy broke out, I was seeing all of this in our feed and realizing how ignorant I was, because I just assumed zero to 20, that's a very wide size range, that covers most people. And then seeing people and realizing, oh wait, she doesn't, she wouldn't fit in our size range. And I saw that over and over again. And it was, a, an, embarrassingly, it kind of took that for me to realize how limited our size range, size range was. And I always thought it was quite wide because a lot of indie brands, when we developed our size range to begin with, ended at 16. So we went up to 20. So I always kind of thought, well, I'm doing more than most. But the reality was, as the business grew, um, once I took a hard look at it, but once I really sat with it and sat with people's pain and feelings of exclusion and realized that this wasn't like, I, I didn't want to run or own a company that made people feel that way. And also the fact that body, body positivity is like a foundational, it's not just for, for me personally, but for the brand, it's really important that people of all sizes feel like they can make and wear the patterns that we design. And so if we're only going up to a 20, well, how honest am I really being to that mission? So once I kind of sat with that, um, and part of that is, you know, we need time to process. I think a lot of these things that break out on Instagram, people get angry and they want to reply right away. And sometimes people need to sit with their feelings and think about it and work through, okay, first now I'm feeling defensive and I'm going to defend my position. And sometimes I've learned never to do that, <laughs> to never reply defensively. But people just need time to, and space to think. And I took a couple days and I really did that. And I sat with my feelings and I you know, like I said, just came to terms with this idea that it was, it was not working with our, I wasn't serving our brand and I wasn't serving our community if we weren't make, doing everything that we could to make our size range more inclusive. Took a look at all of our schedules, took a look at all of the way that we, all the ways that we work and figured out, no, this is something we can do. This is actually something we have the resources to do and it's something we're going to do. So it did end up taking about six or seven months before we ended up releasing the first pattern. Again, because we're a very quality driven company. Um, it's uh, an obsession of mine, like that notches match up, <laughs> that things fit the way that they fit, that instructions make sense to people when they're making them. And so I didn't rush that process. So we had a few months of number crunching, data crunching, serving people, identifying what the most common body type is, which turned out to be in our survey da data, at least in a extended sizing model, ended up being larger busted and a little bit more pear shaped. Okay. Um, so identifying what that size was and then figuring out what this new size chart looked like and then developing blocks and then finally applying those blocks to actual patterns. So the first pattern that we released was our Sienna maker jacket, which I'm actually making right now. And then since then we've released our Rome collection, which was three pieces. Uh, we re-released that in February, I think in extended sizing. And now going forward, all of our patterns will be available in sizes zero to 20 and 14 to 30. And then we're going to try, when we have kind of gaps in our new pattern schedule, go back to older patterns, more popular patterns, and then re-release those in extended sizing. So it's been a journey. Um, I'll say though it's gotten a lot easier. Once we got the kind of initial work done, I think people feel overwhelmed, especially other independent pattern companies feel overwhelmed. Like they're, you know, people were, I'm already working so much. How am I going to do this? Once you kind of get through that initial stage of the data and the blocks, and we've gotten a lot better. I, my pattern maker has gone, has taken courses on specifically drafting for plus sizes because there are certain considerations you need to make, like, you know, adding things like bus starts. Um, sometimes proportional changes need to change a pocket's not going to stay the same size. Um, but it's gotten easier and easier. And the last pattern we were working on, we're going to hopefully launch it in a couple weeks. Um, the the testing came back from the 14 to 30 and it actually looked better on the 14 to 30 group than it did on the zero to 20. So I was like, kind of high five. We're like, okay, we're doing really good at this. <laughs> oh, that's fantastic. Well, you know, the inclusivity on sizes is a big topic. There's another big topic that popped up that 
probably you don't hashtag as much as I hashtag and it's hashtag so over 50 because I'm women my age and um, because I love your pattern line and I've made many of your patterns um, it's easy for me to see my age group in your patterns but I'm curious do you also think about age range do you have a target age range or how, do, how does the age play into it? I wouldn't say that we have a target age range. I say most of the patterns that, if not all the patterns that we design are actually just things that I wanna wear. <laughs> um, things that I think I'm missing in my wardrobe or things that maybe aren't on the market, but that I would like, oh, I wanna make this thing and a pattern doesn't exist for it. Okay, this is the idea we're gonna do it. And then I just hope that people are gonna come along for the ride. So I'm 39, so hopefully that's a good halfway point where somebody who's 20, 30 years older, 20, 30 years younger might also be interested in wearing it. Maybe not 30 years younger, because she would be nine and maybe too young. Um, but certainly I think about, what we do think about internally is, especially in our Instagram feed, is how to really showcase the diversity of the sewing community so that from age to size to race, to nationality, all of those things, I really, it's really important to me that when somebody lands on our Instagram feed, they feel the diversity of the community. And uh, I think this over 50 movement has been wonderful because it's, it's just like in all of these other things that we've been talking about, representation is really important. And it's important for us to see ourselves reflected in the world at large and the brands that we're participating in. So it's something that we took to heart. And so one of the changes we've made last year is we hired our first older model. So her name's Trudy. She's a beautiful 60 something ceramicist. Uh, I took a pottery class with her actually, and I was just like making my ceramic thing and I just couldn't stop staring at her. She was just the most beautiful woman I'd ever seen. And I walked over and I was like, have you, have you ever considered doing any modeling? And she was like, oh yes, of course. I, I've, I've been modeling tons. She's, she's like a very busy model. She's, Interesting. So anyways, I was like, great. Okay, so you know what you're doing? We had our first photo shoot with her. She was like one of the easiest, best models we ever worked with. So we had actually cast her in our last photo shoot again, but everything's canceled right now because of the COVID. Um, so hiring a more diverse cast of, of models, but in terms of, it's, it's, it's actually interesting that you ask this because the new pattern we're working on is a jumpsuit. I won't say too much. It's kind of like a workwear inspired, uh, I don't want to say androgynous, but like a slightly androgynous style. Okay. And the person that thought of to name because we name all of our patterns after people was this woman uh, her Instagram name is uh, Blanc and Blanca wait Black and Blanca yeah she yeah. has such incredible style personal style and this when we were working on this design we were like Blanca would totally wear this this is so her style we should call it the Blanca flight suit and then when we like we had already decided we we're going to do that we rename all of our files we reached out to her and asked her if she was okay it was okay and she said of course and i thought you know what this is actually great because this is a style that it's a little bit trendy right now and i could see an older woman feeling like maybe it's not her like that she couldn't wear it and so i liked the idea of it naturally being a good fit for blanca but then also showing well here's a 65 year old woman who's going to wear this and look amazing so i mean i think that's I don't know if that answers your question or not. Yeah. I, mean, I personally really don't believe in rules like white on Labor Day, no mini skirts after 60. I, I, I think you should just wear what makes you feel good. And so I hope that we can do, we're doing the best job that we can to show that everybody can wear everything. And, and as long as you feel good wearing something, that's all that really matters. Yeah, yeah. No, that's, I, I can't wait to see this. Uh, if, it's, if it's something that, uh, that Blanc and Blanco would wear, and she's someone that I really enjoy following also. I can't wait to see what it looks like. I think it's gonna be a lot of fun. I look forward to that. Um, I wanna talk about the, this naming of your patterns, but before we, uh, before we go there, um, your pattern style and your passion for providing those quality patterns that you've been talking about, you have a, that is a foundational principle for your business is that it has to be quality with quality details. Can you tell us a little bit about the process you go through from concept until delivery to deliver something like that? Certainly. Um, it generally just starts with an idea, which could come from, I get a lot of my ideas when I'm traveling. Um, I think because when you're traveling, your eyes are open and you're paying attention to what's going on around you. So a lot of ideas I have end up being, I'll be in a city and I'll see somebody wearing something or I'll be at Liberty in London and going through clothes and find and I, you know, see a detail that I like. And then I'll start 
either I'm a big research person, <laughs> so I'll start researching, okay, if it's a, uh, like for example, this was a workwear inspired jacket that I'd wanted. I'd seen a, a picture of a vintage French work jacket on Pinterest. So I fell, fell down a rabbit hole of looking at all this vintage work where we kind of get a big secret board of inspiration and then I'll start doing some sketches. And then we have an in-house pattern maker. So once I'm kind of at a stronger ideal point, we'll sit down and talk about what it should look like, what the ease should be, what kind of details we're looking at. Um, I'll do a quick sketch for her. She will probably then go do a tech flat. So she'll just do like a flat illustration of what it looks like so we can kind of figure out things like proportion. And then she'll start drafting it. Um, and then the drafting period can take anywhere from two weeks to a month, depending on how complicated the design is. Uh, we have uh, industrial dress forms for both of our size ranges. So we'll first make muslins that we're testing on the dress form, and then maybe people in the office will kind of try things on to figure out, oh, does this work, does it not work? Then we have sample fitting. So we work with sample fit models in both size ranges. So then we're drafting both patterns in both size ranges, having the fit sessions with our fit models. And then once the drafting is more or less nailed down and everything's double checked and everything lines up, we have a professional grader who we send our patterns to be graded. And then while that's being graded, we'll start working on instructions. And that's another member of our team, our operations manager works with me to work with instructions. So I'll generally have like an idea of if there's anything new or if there's any specific techniques or anything we want to cover, I'll talk to her about that. And then she'll start going through sample production and figuring out order of instructions. She'll write a rough draft. I review it, add things, add notes. This isn't working. This is working. Start figuring out, is this something that needs an online class or is a tutorial or maybe a free sew along? We illustrate everything. And so once we have the final package, um, we'll send that out for testing. So we have two testing groups and each pattern, each size range gets tested um, twice per size. So for our zero to 22, we'll have, that's 11 size, or zero to 20, we'll have 11 sizes. So we have generally 20 to 25 testers per group. We get their feedback back, we go, we modify the instructions, we format everything for print, and then we send it to the printer. So I would say uh, fast, if we could get something out really quickly, it might be three months. If it's something that we're working on, um, like a blazer or something more complicated, it might take anywhere from six months to a year. Wow. Maybe wow. not working on it consecutively, but kind of chipping away at it. Right. I was, I was thinking as you were talking about the, the, the blazer pattern, and I don't think I say it right. I, I was calling it Jessica, and I, somebody recently told me it's Jessica. Jessica, yeah. Okay, the Jessica. Love that. And I thought, oh my goodness, there was so much to that and so many instructions that that must have been a really long process. It was a labor of, <laughs> labor of love. I think that was about two years from start to finish when we first started working on it until we, we finished. And again, not working on it solidly. Um, but I had to teach myself tailoring, <laughs> essentially, because I, I knew that there was a way, you know, if you look at traditional tailoring books, it's like everything's hand sewn and you have pad stitching. And I knew that there's a more, there's a quicker industrial way that there is to, to sew blazers. So I kind of, again, research, being the research that I, nerd that I am, fell down a rabbit hole of figuring out what are these kind of industrial techniques that we can use for a home sewist so that they can make a blazer, not quickly, because no, there's no blazer that gets me quickly, but at least dramatically faster than it would be if you did traditional tailoring. So the reason that took so long is because I was just figuring all that out and I had to make a ton of blazers, a lot of trial and error, what kind of interfacing works, what kind doesn't, all that kind of stuff. And then obviously with something like that, then we have to develop, it's not just the instructions, but we had to develop the curriculum for an online course, which I think was over almost five hours. So <laughs> it's kind of an exponential amount of work when you start getting into building course curriculum so that you make sense on camera. <laughs> oh yeah. Yeah, well, and one of the reasons that I was so intrigued by that blazer pattern is because I'm just not going to, I'm not going to be your pad stitching gal. That's just not the, that's not the sewist that I am. And this was like, oh, speed tailoring. That might be for me. And I, I loved the whole process. I enjoyed it quite a bit. But, um, you know, you said you got intrigued in that, the speed tailoring, the, which is moving away from a more couture and I wasn't planning on asking this, but you just made me think of it. I've noticed you posting about moving towards couture lately. You went to, I think, a Susan Calgie 
workshop and yeah so i did a couture workshop which is something i wanted to do for years i took a couture workshop with susan in new orleans last year and made a gown which was not perfect by any means but was a really incredible experience not only because i was with susan who's taught me so much about teaching because she's just so patient and kind and no, nothing is a disaster every solution can be solved and there's no reason to get worked up about anything um, but also just to be with a group of women who frankly were all over most of the women there were over 50 and it was just really nice to be in a room filled with people who've been sewing for a lot longer than i had and knew a lot more about sewing and who had this kind of collective experience like that part of it was wonderful for me and then i ended up going to paris with her in november on her couture tour um which I had to do a little self-convincing because it wasn't a cheap trip, but I ended up getting so much out of it because Susan at, over, at this point has got made so many amazing connections, especially with the couture uh, and fashion community in Paris. And I was like, there's no way I'm ever going to show up in Paris and get the access to these kinds of craftspeople. Um, so it really sparked a love of couture for me. Um, at this point, I've been sewing... Uh, maybe for some of your audience, it doesn't feel that long, but for nine nine years, and I sew a lot, and I feel I'm quite advanced at the level that I'm at, and I'm somebody who always likes to learn and to get better, and I don't like being bored, and couture just opened up this whole new world where I was like, I could, I could spend the next 30 or 40 years exploring couture techniques and not even get close to mastering it. And that's actually exciting to me. And I also like, personally, I've realized that I like projects that take longer, that I don't, I have all the clothes that I need. I don't need to make a new outfit every week. What I want is the emotional, spiritual, um, psychological benefits of sewing, which is having a project in front of you, being present in the moment, using your hands, using some critical thinking and having something that's really absorbing. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And so these couture projects have been great for that because it's something I can work on for a few months and just have an ongoing thing and learn a lot while I go. So it's something as I'm learning, I, I could see us maybe releasing a, some kind of couture dress in the future and maybe doing some kind of something with it because I would like to sh kind of share that the beauty of couture with more people, but I, I don't think, I'm not there yet. <laughs> I'd have to spend a couple more years building my skills, I think. Well, I, I have no doubt that you will achieve that goal. <laughs> so, well, I think we would be remiss um, if we didn't give you a chance to kind of run through, I don't know if it's all 23, that's a long list, uh, but the, your pattern line list and um, just kind of give people an idea of what they could look for out on your pattern line in your website. Well, we have a pretty wide range of uh, garments. So we have everything from kind of swimwear to outerwear. I mentioned this earlier, but we name every pattern after somebody in the sewing community. And I started doing that with our third pattern because I was completely self-taught from my internet sewing friends. <laughs> I learned to sew use from sewing blogs. And whenever I needed help with something, either somebody would chime in on it with a comment or I would find a sewing blog and there'd be a tutorial. And I really, everything that I had learned, I felt really, really grateful to the community. So it just felt like um, a nice way to kind of reconnect to that history is that everything that we make is linked or inspired by somebody within the community. So most of our patterns, like I said, are named after somebody within the community. So um, some of our most popular patterns, um, the, the Cali shirt and shirt dress still is one of our best sellers. It's a very simple um, cut on sleeve, uh, sh uh, shirt dress with a cuff and there's an add-on sleeve but it's got all these really fun super curved hem options so it's a little bit more exaggerated maybe than a traditional shirt or shirt dress. Mm -hmm. um, our Charlie Caftan is still uh, quite popular it's a um, kind of a voluminous maxi dress or a mini dress and it has either a pleated or a gathered option. Uh, the Jessica blazer ended up being a huge hit last year, which was great because I didn't think that many people were going to want to make a blazer. Um, but we have tailoring kits for that. So we're not shipping at this moment, but hopefully in a couple of weeks we'll be able to start back up. So all of the kind of more obscure interfacings and notions you need for making a blazer are included in that kit. And like I said, there's the online class. And then I think the thing that we're probably the most known for is our ginger jeans. So that was the third pattern I released. Um, and it's for a skinny jean, skinny stretch jean pattern. And it comes with a stove pipe or a skinny leg with a high waist or a mid rise there's a we have a morgan boyfriend jean pattern as well um but yeah we have, oh you like the morgan great yeah, yeah so we have a good range i would say in general the thing that unites most of them is uh an attention to detail and skill building 
we don't tend to do a lot of really beginner friendly patterns. We did a little collection last year that was a little bit more beginner friendly, but for the most part, I'm excited by a challenge. So we try to create patterns that are challenging, but fun to sew and not like not like we provide all of the resources so that if you want to make it, you can. Um, but it's there may be a little bit more time consuming or they'll introduce a technique that maybe you haven't encountered before. Yeah. Yeah. No, I, I really like that. I, I personally have made um, the Carolyn pajamas, I've made one of a pair of those. I've made the Claire coat. I actually took the Claire coat pattern with me to a workshop I went to in Portland where we were learning the coast technique of fabric collage. Oh, and cool. I, I used that and it was, it was, it was the perfect uh, canvas to create art on. That sounds um, beautiful. And then I did the Pietra pants out of the Rome collection. I may not be saying that one right either. But yeah, you got it. You got it. <laughs> um, and I was, I, I'll be honest, I was a little bit uncertain if I was going to be happy with those because of the elastic in the back. Mm -hmm. I love them. I oh, absolutely great. love them. The flat front and easy on, easy off, they're, they're so comfortable. And then I, I've got the Cali, haven't made it yet. I've got, and then I've got the other two pieces of the Rome collection that are stacked with their fabric, but haven't quite made it to the, top. the table yet. Yeah. So, but uh, yeah, there's a, uh, you've got quite a, a nice and varied line and I, I enjoy making the patterns and I really enjoy the quality of your, of your instructions, as I've already said. So. Thank you. I appreciate it. It's nice to know all that hard work isn't <laughs> is seen and, <laughs> and appreciated. Yeah. Yeah. Well, before we go, um, I, I had intended to ask you, but you've already kind of told us that you, what's on the horizon for you next is this jumpsuit pattern that's coming up. And you said it should be coming out in, you said maybe a couple of weeks. Well, I have to finish making, the samples are behind me right now. Um, I have to finish sewing them. We're gonna try to do a DIY photo shoot. So normally we have models from each size range and we're not doing that. It's just, I mean, it's actually gonna be me, which I haven't done. When I first started the company, I modeled everything and now I'm gonna have to get behind the camera. I'll be very happy when we can reshoot everything and I can get, get rid of the <laughs> off our site. So I think that'll hopefully be in a few weeks. And then we have a summer dress we're hoping to have ready in time for the summer which is a bit of a challenge right now with everybody working from home. My pattern makers um, got a toddler at home, so she's doing her best. And then we might do another little collection in the fall, but again, our whole production cycle is a little bit messed up right now, so I'm not entirely sure. And then we were also intending to have two patterns, uh, Charlie and Callie available in extended sizing, but I, I think I have to prioritize new patterns right now just because obviously revenues down, sales are down, everything like that. So I think it's better to, be put, focusing on new things um, and then we'll when we have time we can get back to re-releasing older patterns. That sounds good. Well Heather this has been great. Thank you for taking the time. It's just been tremendous to hear more about your background and about your process and of course we wish you and your family all the best. Be safe and healthy in the midst of all of this COVID quarantine life and um, we are definitely going to be looking forward to seeing what comes next from Heather Lee and Closet Case. Thank you so much, Cheryl. It's been great. Bye.